listening? It is I, Numator 479. According to our studies of your puny mammalian race, we discovered you like very good coffee. And while it is our evolutionary purpose to cause you psychic torment, we want you awake and vivacious to give it. So try our new blend from Spring Hill Jack Coffee, reptilian in the morning. Our proprietary blend of lightly roasted cocayo husks will have you immediately energized upon emerging from the pain cloaca with all your slippery new eggs. Thanks, honey. Hot, hot, I'm cold blooded. Ah. Mmm. Thanks to Spring Hill Jack and last podcast on the left, I'm ready to get out there and eat some babies. Get out of the way, Hillary Clinton. There's no place to escape to. This is the last time. On the left. <laughs> That's when the cannibalism started. I'm trying to dial it in. Dial it in. Yeah, make it where it don't well. fall. <laughs> the problem is you're sober. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I thought about that. I thought about this morning. You thought about that? Getting like, just getting what, like three beers in? Well, I take a look at that road over there outside goggling. <laughs> we ain't talking, we singing. That's what I heard. Was like, he talking? No, that again, Forrest Gump. Forrest Gump. I gotta, I talk, I we, had to, we had to have a whole conversation about you can't fall into Forrest Gump, you can't fall into Ross Perot. Well, that was Ross Perot meets Forrest Gump. <laughs> That's close, though, because yeah. if you hear some of these guys, right, when you get deep into Appalachia, uh-huh. it gets cryptic. And they're, they're saying something. You don't know what they're saying. And they, they don't got, know what they're saying. You ever heard the like, <laughs> man, go down to a country store and get yourself a dope. It's half emotion. It, it is. <laughs> it is. Well, a dope is a soda. Yeah. Really? Dope. Yeah. Put it in. Put it in. There. Get that candy. Get a candy now. <laughs> I love you, 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 you don't adjust the voice at all every time. <laughs> what do you mean? It's the same. <laughs> Stop goggling. I think it comes more down like this. There we go. There okay. we go. All right. This is an Appalachia. The whole, the whole, <laughs> uh, Appalachia. Yeah. There we go. My you got that phlegm in there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, like you've been smoking two packs a day for 20 years. I don't need a filter for the Los Angeles gays. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the last podcast on the left, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Marcus Parks. Here with Henry Zabrowski. I'm down the river, Henry Zabrowski. I lost it already. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. Don't get it we back. have two we'll hours back. to get it back. Oh, yeah. yeah, we do. <laughs> and of course, Ed Larson. Shee! Yeah. Oh, yeah. Come on. <laughs> what a hog talk today. I'm excited. Oh, a lot man. Of talk. So much hog talk. Man, Seriously, play. talk about, and like, huh, never have pigs been more important than true crime. <laughs> <laughs> Except for Robert Pickton. Absolutely. I thank you mm-hmm. for correcting me. But a lot of people say, Oh, the Hatfield McCoy feud. Isn't that just a fight over a pig? And we're here to tell you, <laughs> no, it's a fight over several pigs. That's right. And some of them were ladies in the family. Hey, <laughs> no, they have a glandular issue. Taking place in the Tug Valley along a small river that forms the border between Kentucky and West Virginia. Yep. The feud between the Hatfield and McCoy clans has been a part of the American identity ever since the two families began killing each other in the late 19th century. Yeah, man. Gangster rap. Fuck yeah, man. I went to Tug Valley this morning, bro. (laughs) (laughs) I'm masturbating. (laughs) Now, this feud was by no means the longest nor the bloodiest seen in Appalachia during this time period. And by the way, and by the way, Appalachia and Appalachia are both accepted pronunciations. Usually, if you're more northern, you'll say Appalachia. If you're more southern, you'll say Appalachia. Well, let's yeah. say if you're wrong, you're saying Appalachia. But we, in, <laughs> if we're I'm gonna, saying Appalachia. I want to say up front, before we get in there, obviously I'm struggling with an accent, but that's just because my lack of training. Yeah. But for you guys, like I know we got some Appalachians out Definitely. there that listen to this show, all right? It, and I know they're going to get immediately hopping mad mm-hmm. about many things we're going to get wrong and say wrongs about their town. We're going to say their towns wrong, yeah, certain yeah. things, but just know we know you're separate and 
phallic. You know, an- <laughs> another term is in them hills. In them hills. In them hills. In them hills. Yeah, 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 that works as well. Side goggling. I mean, <laughs> these are people who like use their feet as musical instruments. Hey, Hell yeah, clogging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Man, they were the first musical instruments. They were the first deadly weapon. Mm-hmm. <laughs> feet are great. But yeah, it was not the longest, nor the bloodiest uh, feud that was in Appalachia at the time. Why don't we cover those ones, though? Because the Hatfield McCoys has a Seriously, has a built-in narrative structure. It does. It's a great, <laughs> it really does. It has a great fucking story. And I think that's a partially the reason why the Hatfield and McCoys have been absolutely riddled throughout all of media ever since it began. Yeah, I think they said that in the silent era, there was something like 92 films made like adjacent to the Hatfields and really? McCoys. Yeah. I mean, films were far shorter yeah. back then. You know, it's like, you know, eight minutes. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, there was a huge like outburst of, you know, there was a kind of a trend of like hillbilly films. Yeah. But yeah, even though it wasn't the bloodiest nor the longest, it still resulted in somewhere between 12 and 24 deaths, depending on the source. How do they not know? They don't know a lot of shit. We'll get to that here in a okay. second. These deaths often occurred in gangland-style executions, baka, baka, baka. home invasions, and brutal hand-to-hand fights that turned murderous. Hey, that's my mother you're strangling. <laughs> <laughs> now, is it a home invasion if there's no doors? <laughs> Hey, that's a shack invasion. That's actually, it's, it's a really important to remember that, especially when you're dealing with the M. Dem Hills police. <laughs> but to that point, it's important to know that neither the Hatfields nor the McCoys, neither of them, were a bunch of barefoot bib overall wearing simpletons shaking their fists at each other across the creek as they're often portrayed. Mm-hmm. Some of them were. Some of them were. Plenty yeah. of I them mean, were. I mean... <laughs> Did they make their own moonshine? Yeah. Yes. yes. Did they have names like Bad Jim Vance, Cotton Top Mounts, and Squirrel Hunt and Sam? Absolutely. As they should. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but some were also community leaders with great economic power, at least locally. And most of them lived lives not too dissimilar from any other American frontiersmen at the time. Yeah, they just were truly Kind of extra isolated. They were absolutely extra isolated. Really, the Hatfield-McCoy feud occurred just before Appalachia turned into a pit of poverty and despair. Mm. And it was, in fact, the industrialization of the area that helped fuel the violence. I can't wait to do our coal belt tour next year. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to yeah. Munka Lunka. Uh, we already did Norfolk. and yeah. it Norfolk was, was fine. Oh. Hey, the show was good. No, that was the remember that was the show where there was that massive fucking orchestra pit between us and the the audience Strange was like venue, thirty nice feet away. People. There was no heat on, and it was like thirty five degrees you outside. Were very cold. <laughs> Norfolk had a bigger crowd than Charlottesville. It did, but Norfolk also had that record store that was full of bootleg records. That was yeah, the yeah. absolute worst. Right? I mean, that guy's such a fucking crook. See, I went to that great cemetery, the Hollywood Cemetery. I should have gone to the cemetery. That's good. But put differently, I'm sorry, Ed. No, I can't wait. I, I hope we go again. <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. Oh, here we go. <laughs> put differently, this is when West Virginia began its transformation into coal country with all the misery that followed. And as we'll see, the feud between the Hatfields and McCoys is partly responsible for that. It's weird. <laughs> I guess that was a, a, a like we'll all of it, you. We'll get into it like way deep later. Yes. But. Like all of you, I am certain, except those, because this is a, we're in Marcus's house right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I <laughs> know. He loves this shit. He oh, loves I love this shit too, by yes. the way. Yeah, I yeah. do too. I do too. You got, I have history aids. He gave yeah. it to me. <laughs> and I, I do like it. Ed's always had it. We've yeah, talked yeah. about history for many years. Absolutely. But you, most of us that know anything about this fucking story, we really know very little. Like, I only know it as a name. Again, I know but a bunch of straw-hatted, long-bearded versions of this story in various cartoons. Looney Tunes, yeah. Yeah, but I don't really, I didn't fully understand that this kind of, what was happening right underneath and kind of because of this entire bullshit, it kind of uh, hollowed out that entire part of the country, literally. Mm Mm-hmm. But while the Hatfields and the McCoys weren't quite the stereotypical hillbillies that they're often portrayed as, this feud really was killing for killing's sake. (laughs) It was pure gang warfare. (laughs) But without any of the motivations behind gang warfare, like territory or resources. Or money. Or money. This is just straight up murder. Nobody benefits. Wow. 
Now, as far as sources go today, well, actually, some do benefit, but we'll get into that later. Okay. Now, as far as sources go today, we got two books. The first is Blood Feud by Lisa Alther, which provides a succinct retelling of what can be a highly complicated story. The other is The Feud by Dean King, which gives more of the bloody details. Oh, thank God. The books, however, contradict each other constantly, which is, in fact, the very nature of the story. Yeah. No one involved in the feud left any written accounts because most of them were illiterate, and the newspapers at the time used a healthy amount of yellow journalism to juice the facts or straight-up lie for a better story. I tell you what, you don't even try to show me a pencil because I'm going to use it as gum and steel. <laughs> Help, I'm dying of various cancers. <laughs> Their version of Fox News was when they just chased around a fox to the next town you and found out what's going on. You tell me what's going on. Oh. You tell me now. Oh, shit, I showed up in Parkville. <laughs> what's happening? My God. Oh, it's cloudy. It's mostly cloudy. Thanks, Fox News. <laughs> Additionally, most of the oral histories come from Hatfield and McCoy descendants, who, of course, have their own official juiced-up versions that paint the other side as the aggressors, while they themselves are rugged, individualistic American heroes fighting against a force of pure evil. Depends on which wolf you feed. It depends on who I am mm. every day. Natalie's... <laughs> try to pull it a little bit of this because her family is from some of that area, the far, far western area of Pennsylvania that ah. goes into West Virginia. And she did the, you know, I might have some McCoy blood in me. And I was like, that is what everybody says. <laughs> <laughs> they all say that they have the blood of the, if you're from that area, they're like, yep. My great grandpappy, he was the Hatfield number nine. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know all the names. It's the southern version of the Mayflower. Sure. Yeah. yeah. But somewhere in between the Hatfield story and the McCoy story lies the truth. So we're going to do our best to tell the fairest story we can glean from what the world thinks they know about the Hatfields and the McCoys. Now, as far as where all this happened, the Hatfield and McCoy feud occurred on the border between West Virginia and Kentucky on a fork of the Big Sandy River called Tug Valley. Yeah. Oh, yeah, man. People from West Virginia killing people from Kentucky. What is it, my birthday? Yeah. <laughs> fun. <laughs> hey, man. Eddie, have you ever been to Yank Gulch? <laughs> Horrible place. <laughs> no, it was called Tug Valley, supposedly, because like some of the first guys there, like it's so inhospitable, they had to eat their own shoes. Yeah. Oh, and no, so they, it's a bad they to, place. They had to, to eat their they they had to eat their tugs on their boots. Because if you boil the leather, that's where the expression comes from, right? What I, would, I will if this is true, I'll eat my own shoe. Yeah. I think that just comes from Saddam Hussein. Yeah. <laughs> Did he say that? Was it Werner Herzog? I always preferred eat my own hat. Yeah, oh, because that's a good because one. I can I'll eat my hat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Could be a Texas thing. Well, this was a difficult, densely forested, highly undesirable place to live when whites first began settling there for farming purposes. Although there were, of course, plenty of native tribes already there who've been doing just fine with the land for centuries. But they didn't want them there. So they, no. I believe they called it like the bloody land or the cursed land. They tried to do the thing yeah. where they're like, you don't want to go over there. There's a lot of fucking crazy ghosts over there. And, mm. you know, just kind of. You kind of believe them. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was some, someone put it. It was like when someone like walks outside and shoot fires a gun into the air every like every night, just so gentrification doesn't happen. <laughs> oh, yeah. I love that idea. But as far as the types of people who settled the area went, you had a crew pretty similar to what you had out west years later. You had former indentured servants, escaped enslaved people, and of course, criminals galore. But because it was such an unforgiving land, the people who lived there were tough and extraordinarily independent due to the fact that the terrain itself prevented any sort of infrastructure from forming until the dawn of the Industrial Age. And we're about to find out what, what tough and extraordinarily in the independent people are going to be emailing us <laughs> at the end of the series. <laughs> Accidental death was common, crop failures occurred constantly, storms battered cabins, and settlers were under constant attacks from natives whose land they'd invaded, in addition to bandits who took advantage of an ungovernable land. That's also why we don't know a lot about it, is because record-keeping was spotty, to yeah. say the least. They oh, yeah. with their feet. 
They were being actively murdered by their house. (laughs) In fact, before the Civil War, the Tug Valley had no roads or rails. It had very few schools or churches. It basically ignored calendars. And when the transcontinental telegraph system began to crawl across the country in the 1860s, they bypassed this area of the country completely because the telegraph company figured they had nothing to say. How dare you? I got plenty to say. All right, give me that telegraph machine. Oh, you better come back here. Get, go get, go get, stop. Go, go get now, stop. All right. Now, can you tell me how much money this is? <laughs> but since there was no law to speak of, a man's reputation for violence was the only thing that kept neighbors and bandits in check. That meant that if someone attacked you and yours, it was in your best interest to come back hard with such brutality that word would spread about how violent you were willing to be. This partly explains why so many people in this story have the bad modifier attached to their name, like Bad Jim Vance or Bad Frank Phillips. I assure you my name is Bad Frank Phillips because I'm bad at being Frank Phillips. (laughs) It is not going well for me. <laughs> do not call me Paul. Please do not. Do not. <laughs> Hello, my name is Sal. <laughs> Sal. I'm the bad Sal. I'm the bad Sal. I'm the bad Sal. <laughs> But since nobody really moved to the valley to work for someone else, and since none of the settlers could afford to enslave other people, families were their own labor force and were therefore massive. Probably also, it's one of the only fun things they got to do, which is fucking and coming inside. Oh, it really is. No, in the Tug Valley, sex was very con- like people. I'm gonna, <laughs> okay. I'm gonna laugh <laughs> every <laughs> once in a while. I'm gonna yeah. laugh at Tug Valley. Yeah. Yeah. No, well, I mean, people fucked and sucked constantly. Babies yeah, out of, born out of wedlock were very common. But if where babies weren't happening was on Jerk Mountain. <laughs> None of these are written down. <laughs> this is great. Well, as far as the main players in the Hatfield and McCoy families went, Randall McCoy had 16 children, Woo. while Anderson Hatfield had 13. And here, my friends, is where we're going to get into the prime movers behind the Hatfield and McCoy feud, starting with Anderson Devil Ants Hatfield. My favorite portrayal of him so far. I went and I watched as much as I could of Hatfield and McCoy, like new media. It's all fucking awful. Yeah. You're talking about, are you talking about the TV movie from like 1978? I said it to you, yeah. yeah. Jack Palance as Devil Ants is amazing. Because <laughs> we were saying before, a lot of times back, you know, these days, everybody who's going to play an Appalachian, they go move to West Virginia. Like Daniel Day-Lewis yeah. is there, you know, he's whittling, hanging out with everybody, you know, all that mm-hmm. kind of shit. Jack Palance obviously could not give a fucking shit and he is just Jack Palance yeah. with a fake beard on. It's so funny. I watched a little bit of it. You said that it's amazing. I can't wait to finish it. But he like every time he acts it's what. like it's like he's having a heart attack while he gives his lies. He's so scary. <laughs> I tell you what now. That's my pick now. See? That's my pick now. A man has to defend his heart. Yeah, he's, he's, real. he's intense. Now, no one's exactly sure where Devil Ants Hatfield got his nickname, but as is common with this tale, multiple explanations exist. One was that when Devil Ants was a child, he got into a barehanded fight with a cougar and survived, which caused his mother to say that even the devil wouldn't scare her son. Ants is, of course, a contraction of the name Anderson, which took me fucking days to figure out. Never understood that. Did not know that that was possible. Anson. Like, you know, it's just Ants, Anderson, Anson, Ants. They don't speak right. I, it's, different. <laughs> it's just different. I mean, no, I mean, admittedly, you know, the Texas accent is wildly different oh, from yes. this one. But it is, you know, they're cousins. Flar. Yeah. yeah. Is he flar? Flar. Put it in a poke. Well, another story is that one of the McCoys said that Anderson was, quote, Six feet of devil and 180 pounds of hell. Whoa. Hell yeah, that's, man. That's fucking awesome. That's really fucking cool. Yeah. Yet another is that he defended a mountain ridge called The Devil's Backbone against an entire Union platoon during the Civil War. Isn't there a movie called The Devil's Backbone? Yeah, it's a Benicio Del Toro movie. Oh, no, it's uh, not Benicio Del Toro. Are you thinking of Airborne? (laughs) No, Airborne, the rollerblading movie, and they have to go down the devil's backbone in Cincinnati. That's actually, I did not know that. Jack Black, Seth Green. No, I'm thinking of the Guillermo del Toro movie, Benicio del Toro. Oh, Benicio del Toro. That's devil's backbone. Again, um, it's, it's boring. 
<laughs> yeah. Not airborne, though. I no, love that. That's a great fish thought. out of water. <laughs> well, another explanation, which I think is most likely, is that there were two Anderson Hatfields in Tug Valley. They were cousins. And since Devil Ants was the more wily of the two, he got the nickname Devil, while the more mild-mannered Anderson got Preacher Ants, who will play a huge part in the story in the hog trial to come. Isn't that idea? Yeah, because was it they said that one was the he, he, was it preacher ants, like the guy that was like his good the good guy. Yeah, he was the good one. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. But he was the one that like kind of like consulted with Devil Ants during the feud. Am I wrong? Well, preacher Ants was a part of the feud, definitely. Yes, but he yeah. was like the good guy. Yeah, he was the good one. Yeah. Yeah. Like how cops are good. <laughs> 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 But as far as Devil Ants' ancestry in the region went, his great-grandfather Ephraim Hatfield, nicknamed F of All because <laughs> all the Tug Fork Hatfields descended from him, he'd moved to the Tug Fork in 1820 with his wife and 10 children. It's Jeez. really weird. For some reason, I imagine like that he's like 20 feet tall and he's like <laughs> 25 feet wide. He's like full of Hatfields. <laughs> I was I like, well, like a possum, yeah. but got a bunch of nipples yeah, and all the hat hey, fields are hanging out of them. And like, that's my house. <laughs> that's was my there home. no infant mortality rate back then? It is a huge infant mortality yeah, rate. Yeah, they just they kept still had ten. These they, women are con. They, these women are pregnant from the time they're like fourteen until they hit menopause, and they're just or falling they out of them. Yeah, yeah, it's just. Oh, yeah, yeah. They kick up the leg. <laughs> the baby flies out. It's picking. It's in there. It's digging for It's digging for yeah. gold. Yeah. Two weeks yeah. later, fucking Big pop, F is fucking pop, you again. Pop, yeah. Pop, pop. <laughs> <laughs> you get machine gun in. Some of them are automatic. <laughs> Those are the scary ones. That's amazing. Well, Ephraim begat Valentine, who begat Big F, Devil Lance's father, who was rumored to be seven feet tall and 300 pounds. Woo. True to the nature of the area, men would travel from all corners of the Tug Valley to wrestle Big F to establish their reputation as a guy who could handle himself. Now, that shit's real. That's the thing. If you could, if you're in Tug Valley, right, uh-huh. you got to wrestle fucking Big F and yeah. send him Tug out. <laughs> but it's 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 one thing to pin him, but it's another thing to fall in love. <laughs> And that's when Big F, well, that was his downfall, won't it? <laughs> Devil Ants' mother, however, Nance Pants, was a... God damn it. <laughs> you know, it's just... They, just uh, get used to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was a so-called Woods Cult child. Cult. That Woods Cult child. That's C-O-L-T, which was the local term for a baby born out of wedlock, named after the instances when domestic mares were impregnated by wild stallions. A cult that is born yeah. in the woods, yeah. So it's the first horse women. A bastard horse. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bastard horse, yes. Yeah. Now, concerning her origin story, before the Vances moved to Tug Valley, a man named Lewis Horton had taken Nance's mother, Betsy, to Baltimore, <laughs> then brought her home pregnant and unmarried. Hey, man, if I, if I haven't heard that story out of Baltimore 95 times, I haven't heard it once. Actually, that does sound like a pretty good euphemism for, like, knocking someone up and then leaving them as taking them to Baltimore. <laughs> <laughs> we love Baltimore. We love, no, we love Baltimore. It's one of my favorite really cities. Cool city. It's yeah. one of my favorite cities in the entire country. I adore Baltimore. Yeah. But. Take her to Baltimore. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but after he got her pregnant, Lewis dropped Betsy on her father's front porch and said, quote, Here's your heifer. You take care of her. Harsh. Ooh, ah, ooh. It's Blunt. insulting. It's yeah, insane. yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> that's going to that's gonna raise your hackles. Yeah. In retaliation, Betsy's father murdered Lewis Horton. Yeah, yeah my, that's yeah. one of my habits. Yeah. Yeah. He either shot him or drowned him in the river. We don't really know which one. Probably There's, both. Probably <laughs> shoot him and then throw him in the river. He ain't dead enough. He then escaped to what is now West Virginia and staked a claim in the Tug Fork Valley. But in an incredibly stupid move, the elder Vance later returned to the town where he'd murdered Lewis Horton, hoping that everyone had just forgotten that he'd killed a guy. That's an old school excuse. <laughs> yeah, you don't see it a lot anymore. But it, it's fun to like because that was also kind of back in the time where they might have. They might yeah. have. They might How have long been... did he wait? Do you know? Uh not that long. Not a long enough. Months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't <laughs> like ah, you know, I did my time. You know, <laughs> honestly, why did I leave Tug Valley? <laughs> he, he forgets himself. They had not forgotten, mm. and the elder Vance was subsequently convicted of murder and hanged. Hatfield legend had it that on his way to the gallows, the elder Vance stood on his coffin, sang a song of injustice. There, 
begging me for no reason. I hate to see you guys can't see. I'm going in. Like, How long's this song? <laughs> the song was incredibly long. Any last words? <laughs> well... <laughs> no, after the song, he then talked for an hour and a half. Yeah. Whoa. Second verse, well, same as the first. first. A little bit louder, a little bit worse. <laughs> <laughs> and he does another three hour set like he's Dave Chappelle. <laughs> well, supposedly, Governor James Monroe arrived just after the hanging to pardon the elder Vance. You're pardoned. <laughs> like, yeah, he's fucking dead. Yeah. But all attempts to resuscitate Betsy's father failed. From this story, though, Devil Ant supposedly learned the lesson that when the government gets involved, injustice is likely to occur. Tell mm -hmm. us about it, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, if a man, if the government didn't exist, you would be dead decades ago. I would be very funny, <laughs> captive amongst other strong men. <laughs> My goal would position myself with him, which I've already done. I would position myself in the center of a bunch of very strong men yeah. <laughs> and be the morale. Of course, everyone needs morale. <laughs> but because of this, devil ants came to believe that if a man needs justice, he's better off taking it upon himself to dole out whatever punishment he sees fit. Pig justice. <laughs> That's right. Hog justice, please. <laughs> please. <laughs> Talking hogs, not pigs. <laughs> Now, as far as Devil Ants' appearance went, he was not a handsome man. No. And was sometimes said to resemble a worried troll. Hi, hi, I'm named. I guess I am worried. It's actually <laughs> kind of difficult out here. He had this big, long, awful nose. Uh, he looked kind of like, he looked like uh, sick Rasputin is okay. how I would describe yeah. him. Yeah. yeah. He did, however, have charisma. And he often used his high-pitched nasal voice to tell tall tales and jokes, all of which was very endearing. Comedy helps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This was in stark contrast to his rival and antagonist, Randall McCoy. Yep. Now, as opposed to Devil Ants, Randall McCoy had few stories that lived on, partly because he was an old coot that nobody liked, and partly because he lost all a lot of children in the feud and there weren't as many people to pass down his stories. I try to write to figure this out, right? This is at the very top of this this series, so we'll, we'll unpack it more. But who's the good guys and who are the bad guys? No one's neither, right? Yeah. It's hard to tell. I mean, it kind of... Like in terms of society, because Randall McCoy technically was like lazy and he didn't work hard, where they say that was a stereotype about him and then Devil Ants was hard working, but he also sort of was like a bloodthirsty capitalist. So. Yeah, it, it's really hard to... There's really no good guy. I mean, I guess it depends on your point of view. Hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, Devil Ants was definitely the more likable one. Or is he just more entertaining? Likeable <laughs> and entertaining are very different. Very they true. Are both cold blooded murderers. <laughs> Some guys are still great. Look at Barack Obama. I want to hang out with him. Oh, man. What a great kill count he has. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> He'd be fun. <laughs> what we do know is that Randall was born in 1825 and he married his first cousin, Sarah McCoy, some years later. It's nice to go back to the, the family wick. <laughs> Yeah, I like because she looks like me. It's like jerking off. <laughs> I guess I should have stayed on Jerk Mountain. <laughs> nope, that's why I moved to Tug Valley. <laughs> Tug Valley is when you jerk off into a woman's yeah. vagina. <laughs> vagina. <laughs> <laughs> Just so people know back on <laughs> <laughs> I put the tug in Tug Valley, and you put the bucket in Bucket Woman. Yeah, sometimes we skip some of the lower facts. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad you're here. He's been doing good work. <laughs> well, Randall was a known gossip and was in fact taken to court by his cousin, Pleasant McCoy, for spreading a rumor that Pleasant had fucked a cow. No. Randall was also known to be just an all-around miserable bastard who could clear a room because nobody wanted to be around to hear his constant complaining about everything. But in another contrast to Devil Ants Hatfield, Randall McCoy's first choice for a confrontation was not usually violence, but frivolous lawsuits, which were extremely common in the Tug Valley. You know, it probably helped a lot of violence from happening because yeah. then you can kind of do all this, but it's just, it's country court. It's country yeah. court, yeah. This, however, was not because Randall McCoy was not a violent man. Rather, it was mostly because his wife was a deeply religious woman who took the concept of turning the other cheek seriously, and Randall often did what his wife said. But much to Randall McCoy's harm, in a place where violence equaled respect and inaction equaled weakness, 
Turning the other cheek only emboldened the Hatfields and led to the deaths of many of Randall and Sarah's children. Rise from your grave. Now, one of the big misconceptions about the Hatfield-McCoy feud was that every Hatfield hated every McCoy, and that a fight or a gun battle was likely to break out between them if they ever crossed paths. Now, this was true for some, but not the majority. Kind of unfortunately. Because I love the idea of, like, every Hatfield hates every McCoy. Every <laughs> like, McCoy hates every Hatfield. Like, it's like, like, you picture gangs of New York. Like, yeah. you picture, like, these two huge, like, t- gangs, these teams that all got clubs and bats, and they're across the river, and they're about to fucking just mm-hmm. bump upon each other but like no, it's a big British battle. But as was when we covered Biggie and Tupac and all these various, these types of things, you start to see, like, it's a little bit more complicated. Much more. Most yeah. people just trying to live their lives, not, not being in a bloody feud. Mm-hmm. Also, there's not that many other people around. It's not. I mean, there's hundreds. There's, a, there's hundreds. Enough. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> well, in terms of fighting, there's enough. And hanging, because it's a small area. And so they would meet together as a community fairly often, but it was for giant special events. It's just most. Like th- hangings. Yes, yeah. like hangings. They're Everyone favorites. loved the hangings. Yeah. And then every court. Every time they had, like, a country court thing, they'd all get to show up and hang out and do a bunch of shit. It was kind of an excuse to hang out, like what we do with work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Many of the Hatfields and McCoys actually intermingled and intermarried, and most of them didn't participate in the feud at all. Speaking to Randall McCoy's popularity, even within his own family, only one-third of his force were real McCoys, so to speak. And even those were essentially bullied into participating. Really, the main reason why people started coming to Randall McCoy's side was because the Hatfields were too powerful for McCoy to beat. And since so many of these guys had experience with guerrilla combat yeah. due to the Civil War, the feud was never going to stop until some lawful resolution against the Hatfields could be reached. But then that calls in the government and then they get to do with whatever they want yep. with your land. Yep. Now, as far as why the Hatfields were more powerful than the McCoys, it all came down to a crooked land deal that would come back to bite Devil Ants in the ass years after the swindle went down. Now, this is where we head deep into Marcus territory. Well, I mean, it's it's important. Yes. But we're, yeah. you know, just remember, you know, this is history. You got to learn it. Yeah. Land deals are a part of it. <laughs> yeah, land, they abs- absolutely are. If you didn't know about the land deal, the rest of the story is not going to make any fucking sense. All I know is big hats. Long beard. <laughs> <laughs> See, there'd been a man in the Tug Fork Valley named Jacob Klein, nicknamed Rich Jake, presumably because he owned 6,000 acres of land. It's yeah. a lot of land. Yeah. His nearest neighbor was Devil Ants Hatfield, who at the time had no land other than a small plot where his cabin was. That was because his father, for some reason, cut him out of yeah. the legacy, and he gave land, equal amount of land to all the rest of his brothers. He didn't get anything, and they mostly think it's just because he was an asshole. Well, they think because, well, maybe not asshole, but uncontrollable, he wily. Was, he, like he, was, he, was, he was wild. Yeah, he, was oh, yeah. very, he was very wild, and you, you couldn't trust Devil Ants. His name is Devil. Well, <laughs> he had to then live up again. The name, his name's Anderson. Yeah, his name you know, is Anderson. So, yeah. so eventually, the devil, then he had to kind of act the part. Yeah. yeah. But after Rich Jake died, the land passed to his son, Perry Klein. But Perry after, Klein is a name that doesn't belong in this either. It sounds like somebody that was on Designing Women. <laughs> no one had to be a lawyer. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes, and yes. Perry Klein did eventually become an attorney. Uh, there we go. Wow. Yep. Wow. After a lot of legal maneuvering, bullying, and palm greasing, Devil Ants snatched 5,000 of Perry Klein's 6,000 inherited acres, making Devil Ants one of the largest landowners in the valley virtually overnight. Perry Klein moved to the nearest city, became an attorney, and would later... Side with the McCoys. Oh, yeah. Slowly mm-hmm. waited. Devil Ants was now the owner of thousands of acres of forest, which turned him into a relatively small-time timber baron. And it would be his loyal employees and those who had an economic interest in Devil Ants' timber operation who would make up a large part of the Hatfield force in the feud. This is definitely where you get to sort of the sleepy history part, but it is slightly interesting. And it's extremely I'm interesting. Not this part. This, this is this... extremely interesting. I'm saying what I was going to say. We just learned that they're all not family members yeah. and it's like random yahoos I'm fucking killing people. I'm saying my fact. I was counting my fact, which is that 
before this time period, oftentimes when people would move into the Appalachian area, they would gather sustenance from the forest and they would do wild hog raising where the hogs would go out in the forest and then they would go and find them and would try to get them to, to slaughter them. They would go and find their own individual hogs. Now, this is when it started to change where they realized instead of getting our sustenance mm-hmm. from the forest, the forest itself would be our money making area. Yep, our commodity, because right around the time the Devil Ants got a hold of the timber, this was after the Civil War. And if you'll remember, during the Civil War, a lot of buildings got burned down. Yes. A lot of shit got destroyed, and a lot of shit needed to be reconstructed. No. So therefore, having a timber operation on the fucking border of the Confederacy big was big fucking money. Yeah, especially, and they were... And- Kentucky was burned down. Everything was burned down. I mean, oh, yeah. this is like Sherman's March, you know? Yeah. Well, Sherman, I mean, that was Georgia, but still. But I mean, he had to get there. All yeah. the places got burned. <laughs> <laughs> but when it comes to the long simmering resentments that actually led to the Hatfield McCoy feud, we're actually going to travel back to the Civil War. I feel like, yes, I feel it. <laughs> 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 yeah, we're going to go back to the point before Devil Ants became a landowner, before Randall McCoy got pissed off at him. We are now in 1863. Okay. <coughs> <coughs> Cough. <laughs> 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 the, the sound of 1863. <laughs> yeah, and now we're going to get into the aforementioned guerrilla warfare that occurred on the borderlands between the Union and the Confederacy, i.e. the Tug Valley. See, during the Civil War, Kentucky remained in the Union while Virginia seceded to the Confederacy. But in 1863, West Virginia seceded from the Confederacy to rejoin the Union, which is why we still have Virginia and West Virginia. Okay, cool. that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, a, that's yeah, a nice, that's yeah. a fun little fact. That's a fact. Right? That's yeah. a fact. You Kentucky share that was fact. very split down the middle. Yeah. It was like, it was technically Union, but it was also like half of the motherfuckers were Confederacy people. Oh, But that's course. where you get into the brother versus brother shit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's where you get to the guerrilla warfare. Matthew yeah. Broderick. <laughs> <laughs> was that Glory? Yes. Glory, yeah, Glory. Oh, my Lord. Lord, Lord, Lord. <laughs> yeah. I love that shit. Now, some Virginian soldiers switched sides to the Union when West Virginia was created, but others remained in the Confederacy and became extraordinarily violent and effective guerrilla fighters. Basically, this is Vietnam and Appalachia. Mm -hmm. As a testament to how dangerous and brutal the Tug Valley in particular was, future president James Garfield, then a Union colonel, wrote that the people of the Valley excelled at bloodletting, and he was shocked by the, quote, Bitter, remorseless killing. Now I'm shocked that my name would be used for the fat orange cat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how he didn't have Odie as his VP is like insulting yeah, I'm to this still day. Think I'm yeah. so mad. You remember? Yeah. Uh, they so much time together. Yeah. He's there you un- every fucking day. And yet normal as Secretary of State. I can't believe it. <laughs> War criminal. <laughs> well, in a classic Civil War testimony, and if we may get the obligatory Ken Burns Civil War music while I read this. I just, every single Hatfield and McCoy documentary makes me feel like I'm waiting online to go on Splash Mountain. <laughs> is that is that a bad thing? I'm just saying it's just all the same. <laughs> well, the story of the Hatfield and McCoys is a lot more complicated than you think. It'd Do you know be. what I learned recently? You know the difference between a violin and a fiddle? A fiddle's played by a racist person. <laughs> 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 Coming for you, fiddles. <laughs> Honestly, the fiddle players I, I take are great. offense to that. Cousin, I, uh, my cousin Liz yeah, I, of the Urban wonderful. Pioneers. She is she's wonderful. A fantastic fiddle player. I'm Go listen to the Urban Pioneers. Is, and you love fiddle music. I think I love fiddle music. It's just a good joke, and there's nothing I can do about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, James Garfield. You, you, you will have the music come in. Well, James Garfield had this to say about his campaign in the Tug Valley. We were there to root out the infernal devil that has made this valley a home of fiends and converted this war into a black hole in which to murder any man that any soldier from envy, lust, or revenge hated. James Garfield, 1861. Turn off that fucking TV, Marcus! (laughs) Turn that shit off! It's time to watch football! (laughs) Oh, man. It's just... I'm sick. The music is so soothing. But I was watching documentary after documentary and just... 
<laughs> so just not. <laughs> To be coined what? It's like Fiddler on the Roof if there was no roof. It is. <laughs> Fiddler on my aunt's butthole. <laughs> I love that musical. No, it's suggested by some historians that it was the confusion of living in the borderlands that added Kindle to the fire when the feud came 20 years later, because some were Union and some were Confederate. But in reality, Loyalties were a mess even within the families themselves. There were Hatfields who fought for the Confederacy and Hatfields who fought for the Union. And even within the feud forces, 20 years later, two McCoys who participated served the Union, while another was a dyed and wool Confederate. But as far as Randall McCoy went, we don't even know who he supported or if he even cared at all who won. He didn't want to be involved. Yeah. Although it could be inferred that he was probably a Union man because he was buried in a cemetery named after a Union colonel who hired free black men and led Union forces. That was a huge, I mean, that, that was yeah. a huge, huge thing in post-Civil War America. I might be wrong, so please, side stories, lpotl at gmail.com, but it did seem to be, at the time period, the sentiment is that if you're not choosing a side, you're choosing the Union. Mm. You know what I mean? That's the that's what you're that's how the Confederates viewed it as your you, we because they were highly passionate about slavery and everybody else was not. <laughs> also, I imagine where they're from. I mean, I'm probably wrong when I say this, but wasn't attacked that much just because of all the fucking mountains and hills. I mean, who knows? I feel like there's a you well, know, that's where the guerrilla warfare comes in. Yeah. Yeah. But apart from all that, Randall McCoy was 35 when the war started and had no interest in serving at his age. Devil Ants, meanwhile, was 21 when the war broke out. He ended up fighting for the Confederacy, but not for the reasons you might think. To show just how petty, complicated, and nonsensical people's participation in the Civil War could be on the borderlands, Devil Ants probably would have joined the Union side if not for the fact that he'd been accused of being a Confederate spy by a Union general before he made the decision. So, Devil Ants joined the Confederacy not because he wanted to defend the institution of slavery. Because no one in the area could afford to even have them. Nor did he join out of fear of what freed black people meant, he which had, that was what people who couldn't afford slaves, that, that was part of their reason their for fighting. fear of yeah. it, but they were so far from fucking anything. Yeah, nor did he join for so-called states' rights, which is what a lot of other people said, like we want to have the right to do whatever the fuck we want to do, even if it is slavery. Yeah. And he didn't do it to defend his land from invaders, at least at first, which which is what other guys used as a justification for fighting for the Confederacy. True to form, concerning his later thirst for revenge, Devil Ants joined the Confederate Army for no reason more complicated than a personal grudge. I got a reason. Fuck them. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes that's all you need. You know what, man? You say that, and now I like, I'm like. i thinking about <laughs> back to my ancestors who fought in the Civil War, admittedly, for the Confederacy. Yeah. yeah. God damn, I can see a re uh, fucking ancestor of mine saying exactly that. Really? Yeah. yeah. Just fuck them. Fuck them. Yeah. <laughs> because they said, partially, there really was one vibe I got was that uh, he... People were afraid of any form of massive systemic change. Yes. And so the idea that you know, what you're kind of saying here, the idea of like any change they want to kind of fight against because they don't want anybody, they don't want anything changed about the situation they got, especially Devil Ants. Yeah. He's got a pretty fucking sweet, even though he's got, he's working his fucking ass off. Well, at 21, he actually, at this point, he had nothing. Oh. Yeah. He, he's uh, back when he, when he was 21 years old. This yeah. is before he got all the land? Yeah, Way before. This all is, the oh, yeah. Right, all right. Yeah. yeah uh, this yeah, is I like, I don't know why. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, yeah. back then. No, he's just, he's full of piss and vinegar. Yeah. That's basically it. He wants to fight for somebody, but he doesn't know for who. More and piss then, than vinegar. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he realizes like, he wants to fight for somebody. He's a violent person. But he doesn't really know which one to choose until a Union general sees him from across the river and goes, there says a Confederate spy. Go get him. And yeah. then there's a chase. Devil Ants gets away. And by the time he gets away, he says, fuck him. Yeah. And goes and joins the Confederacy. You say that really good, Mike. Yeah, yeah, it's fun to do. <laughs> May have to be because I've heard that phrase many times Man. throughout my life. Yeah, I feel back like, in, yeah, back I really in Texas. Like the the Parks family crest might as well just say fuck 
fuck fuck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. See, in Jersey, it's more fuck these motherfuckers. Yeah, yeah fuck yeah, these motherfuckers. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> well, further proving that Devil Ants had no real loyalty to the Confederacy, he and 44 other men deserted the Confederate army after the Battle of Gettysburg. Now, some say it was because Devil Ants had been ordered to hunt down and execute his uncle for desertion. More likely, though, Devil Ants and the other deserters had seen after Gettysburg the South was probably going to lose the war. Yeah. And it sounded like the Battle of Gettysburg wasn't, like, cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, it sounded it was, like, bad. It was real bad. Was it, like, 100,000 people or some shit? I don't know the exact body count, but it's uh, it's not as bad as, like, Antietam. Yeah. Like, I think that's the most but uh, all... that's the most American lives lost in a single day mm -hmm. is at Antietam. But everyone but Gettysburg these... was very bad. Yeah, yeah, these Civil War battles are, like... Not fun. Like you get, it's all the infection. <laughs> it's and like the three days of fucking just people laying there screaming, bleeding, yeah. fucking horses dead everywhere. <laughs> Not like, saying it's, <laughs> it's so many dead horses. It's yeah. so bad that I don't even. I feel like even doing the reenactment looks fucking horrible. It's kind of hard. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, more men died from disease than from battles. Yeah. Uh, which I'm saying is worse. Yeah. I think that's worse than fucking just getting shot in the head. It's really bad. Yeah. Well, as I said, you know, Devil Ants after Gettysburg and all these other guys, they saw the South's going to lose the war. And considering the scorched earth tactics employed during Sherman's march a year later, Devil Ants and his men returned to Tug Fork to defend it from Union attacks. And so once Devil Ants returned to Tug Fork, he formed a 600-man guerrilla band called the Logan Wildcats. Woo! Fuck yeah. <laughs> Their purpose, they claimed, was to defend the valley against avenging Union troops, which was indeed a problem, as it always is when armies march through populated areas. Just because they're Union doesn't mean they're morally sound. Yeah, yeah They're armies. They're I'm just happy we all get together, because number one, we're going to defend our land against these Union soldiers. Number two, we're going to play the world's largest game of Dungeons and Dragons. And I got all the snacks. <laughs> but while protection against the other side is understandable, the Logan Wildcats and other borderland guerrilla groups like them also terrorized and murdered families in the Tug Valley who supported the Union, even if those people were just minding their own business, trying to eke out a living in the middle of an active war zone. I These men like, were not heroes. Yeah, and this was not really the time period to do the thing where you have a sign out front that says, like, choose love. <laughs> yeah. This house chooses Beer. I don't need that. That's a good one. This yeah. house chooses beer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is like Renee Zellweger Cold Mountain time, right? I never saw that. Oh, it's horrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it sucks, man. <laughs> Reese Witherspoon fucking sucks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it wasn't Reese, wasn't it? It was Nicole Kidman and, oh, and Renee yeah. Zellweger. Renee and, Zellweger. You know it wasn't even that cold. <laughs> Could have been colder. <laughs> That's all we're saying. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. Coldest Hi mountain. Hyperbole. <laughs> but as it happened, the most ruthless. I'm sorry, Reese Witherspoon. Also, I, I attacked you. Yeah, you know, you so, did just attack Reese. I hope come on the show. Yeah, yeah. yeah. sure. She's wonderful. Reese's pieces. She is good. <laughs> she is actually. She's fine. But as it happened, the most ruthless of the Logan Wildcats was the very uncle that Devil Ants had supposedly been ordered to execute. That was Devil Ants's uncle on his mother's side, Bad Jim Vance. Hell yeah. Reportedly, Bad Jim had a condition that seemed to be fairly common in Appalachia that caused his eyes to bulge from his head and roll around on their own accord. But as people who knew him put it, he could draw a pistol faster than a copperhead could strike. You give me a crayon? I fucking draw on that. I draw a gun so fast. You know, back to that. I don't care that I don't know where the paper is. In other words, his condition made him a tough son of a bitch because he most likely grew up beating the shit out of kids who made fun of him. That's great training. And continued yeah. to strike whenever necessary as an adult against anyone stupid enough to crack wise about his eyes. It's like Dick Buckus. He's got that horrible name, and it's kick everyone's ass for so long. Yeah, you can't handle Yeah, Dick Buckus had to turn into a guy who kicked the shit out of people. Yeah. <laughs> R.I.P. I, I, think he, I think he wanted to fucking go for it, because he could have easily went for Richard, Richard Buckus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's but, like, come on, call me Dick Buckus. <laughs> I tell you. Call <laughs> me Dick. <laughs> it's like on his license. <laughs> so after leaving another guerrilla group called General Witcher's Raiders, who were known to slaughter Union supporters en masse and raise farms, Arms while flying a black flag, Bad Jim joined his nephew, Devil Ants Hatfield, and the Logan Wildcats. 
Seemingly, the Wildcats spent more time searching for targets than they did defending against Union troops. But even though there were a lot of guys in Tug Fork who had joined the Union, the ire of the Logan Wildcats, and therefore the ire of the Hatfields, became focused on a man named Harmon McCoy. Now, I don't know why everyone has to come at me, Harmon McCoy. <laughs> I'm a simple... What was he? Harmon? Harmon. I think he was a colonel. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just a little bit of corn. I don't know why everybody's so mad at me. <laughs> now, Harmon McCoy got on Devil Ants' bad side because Harmon was the guy who chased after Devil uh, Ants when the Union General said, hey, there's a spy over there. Yeah, that's the reason. Yeah, and that's the whole reason. Remember, that's the whole reason why Devil Ants joined the fucking Confederacy. Yeah, it's uh, a lot of stuff. Yeah. Oh, okay. Now, Devil Ants might have been able to forget the accusation but Harmon had also shot one of Devil Ants' friends in the chest and stolen his horses. That'll do it. That'll do it. Now, so Devil Ants first tracked down the general who accused him of espionage. He started cleaning house, and he shot him in his home while he was taking a piss in his chamber pot. That's like old school. That's gangster fucking shit. Yeah, that's just walking up behind someone and popping him in the back of the He's head. He's a fucking general, too. Yeah. yeah a general. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And this is while the war is like, Still happening. I mean, it's winding down. It's near yeah. the end of it. But still, pretty soon after, the Logan Wildcats tracked down Harmon McCoy and attempted to assassinate him while he was drawing water from his well. After feeling a bullet whiz past his face, Harmon quickly gathered supplies and fled to a nearby cave to wait things out. You see him hanging upside down from his stomach. Oh, <laughs> That's all I see in my head. <laughs> they can tell Nothing. I'm not a bad. I am not a bad. <laughs> <laughs> now, was this in Kentucky? Uh, this is... Actually, I don't know if this is the Kentucky side or the West Virginia side. There's a bunch side. of caves in Kentucky. It's super much. close. It's yeah, very, very close. It's right. yeah. I mean, this is all borderland stuff. So It's close enough to not make much of a difference. Okay. Now, what is matter all state line when it comes down to blood being spilled? On the water. <laughs> <laughs> But just as soon as Harmon McCoy started making his way home, he found that the Logan Wildcats had been waiting, and he was subsequently shot and killed. Now, Devil Ants said that he had nothing to do with the murder of Harmon McCoy, claiming that he was sick at home in bed at the time. Achoo, achoo! <laughs> what? In fact, this would be Devil Ants' alibi again and again throughout the feud, that he couldn't possibly be held responsible because he was at home with the sniffles when such and such murder occurred. Ain't none of you bitches ever have allergies! <laughs> Even so, it was probably bad Jim Vance who had killed Harmon McCoy. There was not, however, sufficient evidence to prosecute, especially since there was the matter of the ongoing Civil War, which ended just three months after Harmon McCoy was killed. It's a time that I'd imagine a lot of scores were getting settled. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, because truly, some of these guys probably don't even know that the war's over. Not, not. Yeah, no one's looking. No, you know, just well, you the extra dead bodies. If the news hasn't gotten to you, you're still fighting the war. Yeah. But the fact that Big Jim Vance probably killed Harmon McCoy, that didn't stop one of the main antagonists in the feud to come, Randall McCoy, from blaming Devil Ants. See, Randall McCoy was Harmon McCoy's brother. Just absorb this. Yeah. Remember this as we go. There's so, there are some names. You did a fantastic job of slimming out some of the names. There Thank are you. so many motherfuckers. This is like expert level Game of Thrones shit. This yeah. is just so just remember. So we got Devil Ants. He's the main dude. That's Devil the, Ants Hatfield. That's the, the Robert main Hatfield. Stack. What's well, not Robert Stack? What's his name? Uh, D R Harry Dean Stanton. No, the guy from Game he of Thrones. He kind of looks like Harry Dean Stanton. Oh, uh, which which oh, one? The good Stark. guy. Stark. Stark. <laughs> so you got Ned Stark, Robert Stack, Unsolved Mysteries. Mm -hmm. You yeah. got Ned Stark, right? He that's him. Right? Um, Devil Ants. I don't think anyone's a Stark. The other guy's yeah. the guy from the island town? No, I would say that if anyone... Am I helping? No. No. I would say that... <laughs> Rivendell? All right, it, so no, you got I, I Rivendell. Get, if we're going to say, if we're going to lay it out, I would say if, if we did transpose this to Game of Thrones, Devil Ants would probably be a... Um, the one, the the Lannister, yeah, yeah, the Lannister, yeah, he, they have money, yeah, the the, the one old with, Lannister, the, the one with the money, and uh, yeah, I, I would say the McCoys would probably be, yeah, the uh, the people on the sea, the, uh, the the island people, the island people, yeah, 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 because they don't got shit for shit, yeah, but they're bitter, bitter, they're very bitter and they're very tough, yeah, yeah, so yeah, that would that kind of sort of works. It's not helpful. 
<laughs> no. <laughs> no, I ground this to a halt. <laughs> Rise from your grave. Well, starting in 1866, Randall McCoy began harassing Devil Ants Hatfield with frivolous lawsuits over farm animals and such and such. They were basically just meant to annoy Devil Ants, and Devil Ants returned the favor with frivolous lawsuits of his own. This back and forth went on for 13 years. Yeah, man. And while Devil Ants became one of the largest landowners in the area with the acquisition of Rich Jake Klein's property in the meantime, Randall McCoy remained a curmudgeon with very little power and very little land. Yeah, this dude had it kind of going on. He had a huge workforce. He was starting a bunch of stuff. Like, they were, like, it was like a, uh, the land, this kind of feels very medieval. Yeah. Where you're going up a guy that has like a fucking, like it's a feudal lord mm-hmm. that you're dealing with. I just don't know why they all had so many nicknames when there wasn't even that many people. I know it's crazy, right? I did think about that. I think that, uh, what did they didn't, what they didn't have. Remember how Trapper Keepers used to allow us to express our personalities? I remember. Oh, yeah. Right, they don't have funny t-shirts. They don't have nine, <laughs> out of ten, nine out of ten voices in my head say don't shoot, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't have those things, right? <laughs> like, they, So how do they express themselves? That's what they do. Yeah. So one guy just shows up, and then I also, who knows? You trip over a teapot, you're tripping tea. McGillicuddy. You know I mean, mean, that's like, a great name. Trippin', right? Trippin' T. McGillicuddy? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but you have, like... They have an Irish rapper. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like it's straight up their version of me wearing different kinds of shoes. Okay. <laughs> well, likewise, Randall McCoy's many sons had even less power than him, which was a situation that was not going to change, and they knew it. This, some believe, was one of the driving factors behind the feud. See, this was one of those times and places in American history where the next generation was guaranteed to be worse off than their father's generation. Heard that story, baby. I mean, this is like the housing crisis of 2008. Yeah. But back then, it came as a consequence of the Industrial Revolution. Right in the middle of the Hatfield-McCoy feud, families all over the Tug Valley were being swindled out of their land because a massive coal vein had been discovered in their backyard. And more were cheated out of their land when it became necessary to build railroads to transport the coal out of Tug Valley. Black gunk. Texas shit. <laughs> <laughs> there. Now, who, about, who is that? <laughs> <laughs> Which one? That's the guy from the Hatfield McCoy show. It's the, it's the very top of us. That's, that's the theme song. But uh, it was as soon as they want that coal, man. They want as soon they as that coal was to say it was. They said it was a thirteen foot wide vein. Yeah. It was a uh, extraordinary. I mean, this was the it's beginning. Like Tommy of Lee. It. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, therefore, you had a lot of angry young men like Randall McCoy's sons with no purpose, no future, and no hope, which, as we know, almost always results in mass violence. Woodstock 99. <laughs> <laughs> Those are all trust fund kids. Yeah, but they got no fucking, they got nowhere to go. They got nothing to do. There's no war. Yeah, no water. It's hot. Yeah. They had to go. Fred to- Durst. <laughs> <laughs> That's what this is missing. Back cat, backwards cat Fred Durst. Oh, Actually, yeah. if you could distill it all down to one song, it would be break stuff. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Good yeah. old bad Fred. <laughs> <laughs> bad Fred Durst. <laughs> See, these boys were looking for something to make them a hero, something to set them apart, something to make them feel anything but despair. Well, they also did a bunch of years of guerrilla warfare, and how the fuck do you just tell them to shut that off in your fucking brain? Well, a lot of these kids, a lot of the younger kids, they didn't, they didn't participate, but they did have uncles and fathers who told them how to do it. Yeah, they're all like Richard Ramirez's uncle. They're yeah. all like the same style of like a cousin with a guy they came in and to explain how Miguel. fun violence is. Yeah, yeah and showed them the pictures like, here's a picture of me raping a Vietnamese woman. Here's a picture of her head so being do you cut have, off. Do you have anything of like fun meals you ate or like <laughs> anything you saw? I heard Ho Chi Minh City was incredible. <laughs> but participating in feuds, i.e. gang warfare, that was the easiest way to reach this goal, feeling anything else, feeling some sense of purpose. And a a lot of people in Appalachia died as a result. This, of course, benefited nobody but the very industrialists who were destroying their way of life. Oh, yeah. They just watched them all fight. and They know we're going to bring my big old government skaboon and I'm going to skid off. I'm going to drink your fucking milkshake. Yeah. yeah. The constant murderous feuds. Yeah. <laughs> just keep yeah. I'll spoon your milkshake. I'll, fuck, I'll, fuck yeah. you. I'll spoon your fucking <laughs> Fuck you both. 
<laughs> the constant murderous feuds allowed companies to frame the theft and destruction of Appalachia as bringing civilization to the savage whites of the mountain in what could be seen as a sort of large-scale industrial gentrification. Look at how bad they're fucking it up. We got to come in and fix it. We got to. Therefore, people outside of Appalachia actually applauded the changes taking place, seeing it as progress because the ensuing media coverage of the Hatfield-McCoy feud portrayed them all as backwards, barbaric hillbillies. Well, barbarian was the word used a lot to describe really? these people. Well, yeah. Some of their behavior didn't help. No, it did not. But yeah. still, they, you know, they just had our coal. And there were a lot of people in New York and Boston that were being like, oh, that coal looked mighty fine over here. Mm hmm. But as far as the Appalachian people went, the feuds themselves were somewhere between a problem and a welcome distraction. In other words, in an area where churches and schools were limited and very few people knew how to read, feuds were entertainment. See, while a lot of people on Appalachia didn't participate in the feuds directly, they loved following them. They loved talking about oh, them. Yeah. It's basically a reality TV show where you could conceivably get killed if you're not careful. Put differently, while the people of Appalachia were busy with distractions, the industrialists took their lands bit by bit. And before the people of West Virginia knew it, they'd gone from independent mountain folk to wage slaves. It's just that easy. <laughs> it's really <laughs> fun, but it really was. I owe my soul to the company stone. <laughs> you got 16 tons. What did you get? Another day older oh, and a deeper in debt. Oh, now, Jane Peter, Peter, won't you tell me a go? I owe my soul to the company Stop. store. Yeah. Do, do, it's very do, depressing. Do, do. You guys have that shit. <laughs> <laughs> See, once these people had no choice but to become coal miners, they were paid in scrip, which could only be spent at the store owned by the company they worked for. That's what Tennessee Ernie Ford was talking about. This made escape from poverty or even escape from the area impossible. Yeah, because now you got Apple H bucks that yeah. you have to spend. <laughs> <laughs> that inescapable fate reverberated down through the generations, and that's partly why West Virginia now has the highest rate of opioid overdoses in the nation by a country mile. And that's how the Hatfield and McCoy feud led to the opioid epidemic in Appalachia. I absolutely side with the opinion that the feud between the Hatfields and the McCoys is a far more consequential piece of American history than what people think it is, especially when you consider that this area of the country is more or less the cradle of the current opioid epidemic. I mean, just watch the wild and wonderful whites of West Virginia. Oh, Woo! yes, yes. But you know what? It's it's like a smokescreen. The Hatfield McCoy feud story is sort of a smokescreen over what really happened, which yeah. is we have this like super interesting violent feud, which we're covering because it's fun and we love history. But as we're coming underneath it, it's this like, it's how the... People with a broad view yeah. viewed what they were going to do to this small part of the country because they were just rolling under the wheels of manifest destiny. Yeah, I mean, like, and even like, we're talking a lot about West Virginia, but Kentucky is a sad ass place too. I mean, like, yeah. even their grass is blue. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Very, very much. Very much. <laughs> but the consequential nature of the feud makes the overall catalyst all that more ridiculous. Because while their way of life was slowly crashing down around their ears, they were all sitting around arguing about a goddamn hog. Several hogs! <laughs> <laughs> now, to be fair, hog theft was serious business to mountain folk. Having plenty of pork could be the difference between life and death during Appalachian winters. And hogs made up a large portion of a farmer's wealth because they could be sold for cash during hard times. It was an asset. As the local saying went, because every part of the hog was used in some way or another after slaughter, the only thing they wasted was the squeal. Yeah! Woo! Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> yeah! Yeah! I need to squeal if I could. <laughs> I, I bet you would. Yeah. That's all to say that hog theft in Tug Valley was near akin to horse theft out west. Although the way farmers kept their hogs left ownership pretty easy to muddle and therefore open to accusation and argument. Well, it's both uh, about over over familiarity has two sides to it because there's one side of like, well, we all know each other's stuff, but it's also the other side is we all know each other's stuff. So mm -hmm. these pigs were marked 
in a way. Well, we'll get to that here in a second. See, since the Razorback hogs raised by the farmers of Appalachia were territorial, they were left to wander and forage in the forest that surrounded their farms during the spring and summer. And then in the fall, they were herded home for fattening and slaughter. Seems like such a fucking pain in the ass. But yeah, yeah, it's the only thing you could do, though. But you, but they I still do that. Yeah, they my just family, let them all out in the forest. And then... No, my family still does that. You let them out in the pasture, and then when you need them, if you need to, you know, give them you know, medication. You don't go you... put them to bed or stuff. <laughs> like literally, I mean, no. like, there's like other pigs that are like in a pen and shit, but these are wild. Well, these aren't. No, these are older Hug, pigs. And yeah, they're they, hogs. yeah, these these are all yeah the hogs. But your get family the hogs doesn't out. go like no, I without... literally. I mean this. I thought that a farmer would go. He has, he wakes him up, he wakes up the pigs. Rancher. And he gives them, to whoever he, that guy is, he goes out there <laughs> and he feeds him, and he slops them up. And then they hang out all day, right? And they do whatever pigs do, right? And then I thought he put them to sleep. <laughs> like I thought that they, well, he, the rancher would come and what, literally go what, like. Hug them and sing to them? And not sure. like, but I thought that they would have to, there's like a trend. Well, I don't know from pigs, but I know with cattle, like we, they are set out onto the pasture to graze. You leave them out, you know, you Every leave day? them out there. No, they stay out there. So you never bring them back in. No, sometimes you do. When? When you kill them. Yeah, when or you milk them. Yeah, when you're wanting to the well, like when it's when it's calving season, uh, when you want to get you when you have to medicate them, when you have to give them vaccines or anything like that. Uh, when you're going to take them to but sell, they just where live they out get there? slaughtered. They just, yeah, yeah, they just live out there. Oh well, yeah. Uh, and then sometimes you got to go out and you got to get on a horse and you got to go find it. Oh well, yeah, because you go and you count because you do count the cows every day and be like, up, 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 ninety five, ninety six, ninety seven. Great. That nope. Ninety nine's missing. And then you know by the ear tags, you know like up ninety eight's missing. We gotta go look for ninety eight so you get on the horse. Pain in the goddamn ass. (laughs) It's one of the worst jobs in America. Good lord. But cheeseburgers are great. Yeah, Yeah. cheeseburgers are great. Give me the hamburger. (laughs) They love it. They absolutely love it. Let them. But to make sure that you didn't confuse your neighbor's hog for your own, farmers made individual notches on the hog's ear to identify it. Welcome to fucking Agriculture Corner, everybody. I hope, y'all, I hope y'all have your FFA membership. Yeah, this again is a Marcus <laughs> yeah. thick episode. Well, when I was born, my mother put some stripes on my ear and like I never got too far. It was yeah, because yeah, she knew. It's like, <laughs> that's my hog. <laughs> Even besides that, though, most farmers were said to be able to identify their hogs by sight alone. Sure. And this is how Randall McCoy came into conflict with Floyd Hatfield. One day, whilst Randall McCoy was out searching for a missing hog, he passed by Floyd Hatfield's farm and thought that he recognized the missing hog amidst Floyd's hogs. And so, a hearing was convened at Preacher Ants Hatfield's cabin to suss out who this hog belonged to. Hog (laughs) justice! This was apparently the social event of the season, as seemingly the whole valley descended upon this cabin, wearing their Sunday best to go see where this hog was going to end up. I feel like this is the perfect example of when you could do the thing of, and so I will split this hog in half. No! And give one half <laughs> Let to him the... have the hog. <laughs> Meanwhile, he, he's like, all right, he takes the hog, immediately cuts it in half. <laughs> yeah. No, actually, one of the, I think it was one of the McCoys later said, it's like, if they would have just barbecued that hog up, we could have saved a lot of trouble. Yeah. Like, just barbecue it up on the spot. And indeed, when the hearing convened, the hog in question was trotted inside and placed in the middle of the cabin so arguments could be made concerning who was going to go home with the hog. No, I say, I do say, I say, I say, I say, I say yeah. we need to put the hog on the stand. Now, Mr. Hog, or is it Mrs. Hog? Let me see. Oh, got a pussy. Mrs. Hog, can you point toward jury rifle owner? <laughs> God damn it, Mrs. Hog. I'm, I'm going to fucking, I'm going to marry you. God <laughs> fucking, I would have so much shit. You can suck <laughs> a squeal out of me any day. <laughs> Oh my God, suck. she can talk. <laughs> oh, suck the squeal suck out. Suck the squeal out. Honestly, <laughs> awful. I'm going to start oh, saying yeah, that yeah. because sometimes the, I do need to get the squeal sucked out. <laughs> <laughs> it's very important. <laughs> well, some people opined that the hog bore Randall McCoy's notches on its ears. Others said that the notches were so disfigured as to be unrecognizable, while some even tried arguing that there were no notches at all. And that's just how the hog's ears were. Just yes. cut the ear off and feed it to a dog. Just everybody <laughs> eat the pig. Just everybody eat it. Now, the monkey in the middle of all this was, as I said, Devil Ants' good-natured counterpart, Preacher Ants, who did not want to take personal responsibility for declaring ownership of this hog. Pussy. 
Well, I mean, it was a hard, th- even at this point, before the feud even started, it was not a good idea to take sides between the Hatfields and the McCoys. Sure. Even if you were a Hatfield or a McCoy. Sure. And Preacher Ants is just, he's a good natured man. Yeah. He does not want trouble. I just want things to be cool here, man. Yeah. He also couldn't get anyone to serve on the jury because if the McCoys won, the Hatfields might punish the jurors economically. But if the Hatfields won, then the McCoys were likely to get violent because they were, according to one study, scientifically violent. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's true. <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> See, one of the more interesting wrinkles in this tale actually came over a hundred years after the feud in 2007. Yeah, that's weird. When an endocrinologist published a study showing that modern McCoys suffer from a hereditary disease called von Hippel-Lindau syndrome. A petulant asshole flu. <laughs> <laughs> This syndrome produces small tumors all over the body. But interestingly, 75% of the modern McCoys tested had tumors on their adrenal glands, which caused their production of adrenaline to greatly increase. And this increase in adrenaline, of course, caused regular violent outbursts. Do you think this is why Holden turns into such an asshole? (laughs) (laughs) He's from the the North Carolina, McNeely. And his fucking grandparents were first cousins. Yeah, That's very right. Mel, baby. <laughs> Way Mel, baby. I want to pop. Do right, you think if you shave the top of his lump, there'd be a little angry face in it? <laughs> Fuck you. Is this a lunch meeting? I, uh, lumps on a person do not make them happier. I know no, that No, it doesn't. <laughs> Unless it's these two, the big tits. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But do your lumps make you happy? They make me me. <laughs> and isn't that the best answer you can give? It's just me. That is fucking awesome, though. Yeah. yeah Lumps right? on my it, adrenal gland and yeah, shit. That yeah, is man. literally what might have caused a lot of their just like literally going, woo, woo, woo. <laughs> <laughs> it was all biological. <laughs> now, this explanation doesn't quite cover why the Hatfields yeah. were also extremely violent, but considering how the two families intermarried so much prior to the feud, it's possible that this syndrome was present on both sides of the conflict, especially when you consider a lot of the participants weren't official Hatfields or official McCoys. It's just this fucking syndrome is just in they were this all area. Fucking, yeah. yeah. Now, Preacher Ants Hatfield eventually figured out a way to kick the can down the road by appointing six Hatfields and six McCoys to the jury, hoping that all of them will vote down family lines and hang the case. But then where does the pig go? That, I, I don't think he was thinking that far. Just fucking do a barbecue for everybody. This is what that's, everybody keeps saying. That's what they said. They said if they would have done that, then we could have avoided all of this. However, <laughs> yeah, we could have, they could have avoided all of this. And West Virginia would now be like fucking Atlantis. Oh, would it be Canada? <laughs> <laughs> like Wakanda? Yeah. Like you show up as like floating cities above West Virginia. It all like, ha- hangs on a pig. Society, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> However, after a man named Bill Staten swore that he saw Floyd Hatfield notch the hog himself with his own eyes, One of the McCoys sided with the Hatfields, saying that Randall didn't have any evidence to counter Bill Staten's testimony. More likely, though, this McCoy sided with the Hatfields because he'd fought with the Logan Wildcats with Devil Ants during the Civil War, and two of his sons worked on Devil Ants' timber crew. Additionally, Devil Ants awarded this McCoy 120 acres of land after the trial. Which actually, you know what's interesting? He kind of reminds me a lot of John Gotti. Because I watched a John Gotti documentary that's on uh, Netflix. And uh, because that's what he did when he first got off on the first like series of racketeering charges. John Gotti very publicly paid off like four jurors, like 60K a piece. Yeah. Fuck yeah. And so Floyd Hatfield got the hog. Although from that day forward until the day he died, he had to live with the name. Hog Floyd Hatfield. I just need, is there a formal appeal? Is there a way for me to talk to some judge? I Fuck mean, you, Hog Floyd. I just, I just, I, I just, I testified. I testified. No, he got the hog. Yeah. It's because he got the hog. He became Hog Floyd because, oh, doesn't Hog Floyd Hatfield, oh, watch out for him. He's going he, to make a big old stink about his hog. He got one more hog. I guess. If you're a defensive <laughs> lineman, it's a great nickname. Oh, oh Hog yeah. Field, yeah, Hatfield. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Hog <laughs> Floyd Hatfield. Oh, yeah. man, he sounds like he fucking plays for Alabama. Yeah, just eats quarterbacks. <laughs> so cool. 
<laughs> now, from there, the feud came in fits and starts, mostly in the form of rock throwing. It was a lot of rock throwing. Hey, you know, <laughs> what else Stere- you to do with them? Yeah. Yeah, stereotypes come from somewhere. <laughs> and half-hearted gunfights between boats on the river that wouldn't have been out of place in a Trailer Park Boys episode. Like, you know, when they get into gunfights yeah. and one of them gets shot and they're like, time out for yucks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But each time a Hatfield got his ass kicked by a McCoy, a Hatfield would return the favor and vice versa. And that's how I, I, eye for an eye makes everyone blind. Gandhi said that while he was fucking a little girl. And she was like, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Big Daddy. Yeah, while Mother Teresa was in the corner saying she deserved it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, she was going yeah. to be, be, be closer to God after it happened. Another fucking leper. This more God money for me. <laughs> but in the fall after the hog trial, the feud finally came down to murder when Randall McCoy's nephew, squirrel hunting Sam McCoy, that's... Guess why? That's who you would play if this was an LP. <laughs> he cast my LP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, he's definitely. You only say that Sam because McCoy. I did such a stellar job with Tolis Joe, and you imagine them to be the same people. Yes, absolutely, yeah. they're cousins. Yeah. <laughs> well, Squirrel Hunt and Sam McCoy. That's crossed... a long nickname. Squirrel Hunt and Sam McCoy. Yeah, Squirrel. Hunt... You just but... call him Squirrel. No, he calls Squirrel Hunt and Sam because yeah. I would imagine he would take he would take issue with Squirrel because he kills Squirrel. Ah, see, uh, squirrel. <laughs> 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 he obviously has no love for squirrels because yeah. he got his name because he'd walk the same 25 mile stretch of road every day just to hunt squirrels. Sometimes he'd kill a hundred squirrels in a day and then he'd show up at the church and say, hey, I got you these squirrels. You going to serve them to community dinner? You Thanks. know. Thanks. <laughs> wow. Um, more squirrels. I do find it interesting. I've actually had many people talk about liking squirrels. Yeah. Eating squirrel. I think it's one of those you, you depending on where you're at in the no, country yeah. and especially in the Appalachia area, if you eat squirrel, you kind of get a taste for it. I would imagine, yeah. Yeah. It's chicken wings of the forest. <laughs> That's chickens. <laughs> <laughs> they had chickens. Well, squirrel hunting Sam McCoy crossed paths with Bill Staten, whose testimony, if you'll remember, had supposedly swayed the turncoat McCoy during the hog trial. Bill Staten, by the way, wasn't even a Hatfield by blood. His sister was married to Ellison Hatfield, Devil Lance's brother. And since Devil Lance was a local mover and shaker, Staten, of course, hitched his wagon to the Hatfield clan. All right, yeah. So this so happened a lot. Bill yeah. Staten is just like a like he's a hanger on. He's well, a part of it. He's a, a by marriage. He's in the he's in the Hatfield family by marriage. He's crip by association. Sure. Sure. Now concerning the confrontation between Squirrel Hunt and Sam and Bill Staten, it's impossible to know who the actual aggressor was. But according to Sam and his brother Paris McCoy, it was Bill Staten who decided to take out two McCoys that day. But considering Staten's role in the hog trial, I think it's more likely that the McCoys shot first. Yeah. Or Staten was just dressed like a squirrel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he was the first furry. And no one knew that he was out there expressing himself, not sexually. This is my persona. Do not come to me saying that my persona is wrong Bill, or weird. Bill, I'm not saying it's wrong that you think that you're a squirrel. I'm just saying we have one associate of ours who specifically kills squirrels. <laughs> I kind of wish you'd go for a rooster. I, I, I would rather to... live on my feet than die on my knees. <laughs> Excuse me, I gotta go bury some nuts. <laughs> You're gonna need to go to dogs in a bathtub plateau for that. <laughs> <laughs> but as the story goes in Dean King's book, Bill Staten hid behind a bush when he saw Sam <laughs> when he saw Sam and Paris coming. He's even acting like a squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> he ambushed the two McCoys and hit Paris in the hip. Paris fired back and hit Staten in the chest, after which the two of them dropped their rifles and fought hand to hand as blood was just spurting out of their wounds. Cool. Squirrel hunting Sam, meanwhile, was aiming his pistol, but was hesitant to pull the trigger because he didn't want to hit his brother. But when Bill Staten sunk his teeth into Paris's throat. That's Civil War fight. Yeah, 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 yeah. About to rip it out. Squirrel hunting Sam put the pistol to Staten's head and blew his brains all over the Appalachian wilderness. There's one less huge squirrel. 
<laughs> I died as I lived. <laughs> That's how he got caught. He brought it to the church for everyone to eat. <laughs> oh, I just thought it was big. I thought it was big. <laughs> well, after prying Staten's jaws open, Sam and Paris left the body where Staten was killed. It was found days later, decomposed, half-eaten, and nearly headless. And so the score was one Hatfield and one McCoy. Check the over-under. <laughs> now, I'm not exactly sure how it was known that Squirrel Hunt and Sam and Paris McCoy were the killers, but Valentine Hatfield, known to his friends as Wall, was the justice of the peace in the district where the murder took place. I kind of feel like they just told people. Or other people, you know, they came back and like, got ourselves a McCoy today. Mm-hmm. Ah, uh, a Hatfield. Got ourselves a Hatfield today. Technically a Staten. Fuck you. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Wall Hatfield issued warrants for the arrest of the two McCoys. But while Paris was captured within a month, it took two years to track down Squirrel Hunt and Sam because I'd imagine anyone named Squirrel Hunt and Sam is going to be a slippery little feller. Yeah. Yeah. They weren't looking in the trees. (laughs) The idea how hard it would be if I was ever renting a house and on the form it said like, you know, like, Sam Hatfield, you know, like, you know, they say you like, how do you want to be referred to Mm -hmm. squirrel hunting? I just feel like, I'm sorry, we can't, you can't be here (laughs) because it's going to be hard to get rent (laughs) from squirrel hunting Sam. And even harder to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. Both McCoys, however, were acquitted on grounds of self-defense, although oral Hatfield history maintains that it was Devil Ants himself who arranged for their acquittals in the hopes that the feud would go no further. Even if that is true, though. It only put a pause on proceedings because a fateful election day was fast approaching. Now, election day in Tug Fork was an important, popular, and raucous social function. Whoa, just like we wanted to be with Dave Matthews Band. (laughs) (laughs) As one local put it, uh, election day was like a wedding without a pastor. Yeah, Yeah. like a party at Kiefer Sutherland's house. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Pastors are legally not allowed to go into Kiefer Sutherland's (laughs) house. Everyone again dressed in their Sunday best. Farmers came down from the mountains. They bought and they sold horses. They bought and sold goods. And they bought and sold votes. But it was also a drunken fucking mess. Mm. See, voters were usually bought with whiskey or moonshine. And because most people voted in the morning, everyone was fucking hammered by the afternoon. This is how we get people back to the polls. (laughs) We make it into a big party like this where it's all the sucking and fucking, Mm -hmm. drinking and fight. Oh, man, there was sucking and fucking. Men picked up women. Women picked up men. I'm saying we do it now. Do you not do that on election day? (laughs) No, I I normally sit in a solemn remembrance. Um, I cleanse myself with the, I do a full um, enema. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, a, a bourbon enema. Yeah, I need a couple to vote for Biden. I'll tell you that. Yeah, <laughs> it'll be fine. We'll get him in there. I honestly, it's fun. It's the creepiest vote I've ever done because you get to vote for an actual skeleton. <laughs> That's a funny joke. <laughs> That's a funny joke. We need to. We just, yeah, unfortunately, he must we just have alive. to do it. We just we have, have to, to do it. Just do it. <laughs> well, at these election days, fights broke out constantly, and fiddlers and banjo pickers soundtrack the whole thing. Of yep. course, yeah. this is before the advent of bluegrass, so this is a, a different type of picking and banjo, uh, picking hey, and fiddling than hey, you're used to. Hey, ho. Yeah, Mumford and Sons without the corporate fucking bullshit, man. <laughs> <laughs> Mumford and Dads. Yeah. Fly from your grave. Now, the Hatfields were big moonshiners, and since they often had the best liquor in the highest quantity, usually a variety of moonshine called Applejack, their candidates were often the ones that got elected. Now, state authorities did try to put an end to this by issuing dozens of indictments, but the Hatfields never served a sentence because most of the jurors drank Hatfield moonshine. And that was besides the fact that the Hatfields were also heavily armed. This is back in the day when the second, quote unquote, whatever would become the second, the second Amendment meant something because you had the same guns that the government had. <laughs> where it's not like you're not against massive robot bodies and drones. Yeah, and tanks. Yeah. 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 But on Election Day 1882, it was more of a problem of too much Applejack than too many guns. And that, of course, led to the escalation of the Hatfield-McCoy feud. Now, by this point, Randall McCoy had racked up a fair number of grievances against the Hatfields. There was, of course, the matter of the hog. Hog, just. But that wasn't the only thing that bothered Randall. 
Allison Hatfield had testified against squirrel hunting Sam McCoy and his brother Paris during their murder trial, even though everyone was saying it was self-defense. The land snatch that made Devil Ants powerful had always rubbed Randall McCoy the wrong way, and there was a fair amount of jealousy. Yeah, because he also was fucking, did technically sort of take it by force. He did. He, he's not a nice man. No. And there had even been a sort of Romeo and Juliet situation between Devil Ants' son, John C., and Randall's daughter, Rosanna. And that should have healed everything. Honestly, though, that story is... Far too complicated and long to go into. But suffice to say, it did not end well for the McCoys, with John C. eventually marrying Rosanna's cousin Nancy, but only after he left Rosanna to temporarily shack up with a sex worker named Belle Beaver. Love her. My name's Belle Beaver. (laughs) Hey! Hey! I'm Belle Beaver! You mind if I chop some wood? (laughs) Hey, now, hey! Get up in my damn fine vagina. Bell Beaver is honestly a great burlesque name. It really is. Yeah. It really is. But that's all to say that Randall McCoy, who was known as a constant complainer, had spent years telling his many violent sons all about how terrible the Hatfields were. And on Election Day 1882, the Hatfield that got caught up in that hatred was Devil Ants' brother, Ellison Hatfield. God, this is so exciting. We have nothing like this. I think we have a lot like this. Yeah. What do you mean? Violent local grudges breaking yeah. out into constant murders. This is, I think, happening all over America every day, constantly. Have you not been to Little Rock? <laughs> not in a while. <laughs> not since Bill and Hillary brought me on that cocaine airplane. <laughs> Do you remember when that like whole family killed the other family in that little town in Ohio a couple years ago? Wow. I didn't hear about that. Well, I'll bring it up on next time I'm on Side Stories. Yeah, Perfect. <laughs> now, as I said, Election Day was always a drunken mess to begin with. But when four of Randall McCoy's sons arrived, they were already liquored up and ready to throw down. Those sons were Bill, Bud, Tolbert, and Farmer. With a PH. Farmer with a PH, <laughs> not an F. Yeah, because that's a name. Yeah, Farmer McCoy. Mm-hmm. Now, in one version of the story, the McCoy brothers were causing trouble, racing up and down the roads on their horses and shouting nonsense. Yeah, woo! Yeah. Ah! Woo! Ah! Woo! Ah! Tolbert, for example, jumped off his horse and shouted, quote, I'm hell on earth. Fuck yeah. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> but to that, Ellison Hatfield, who didn't think much of Tolbert, retorted with, quote, You're a damn shit hog. Now, shit hog, that's a real thing and a great fucking insult. Okay. Yeah. But shit hogs, just so you know, shit hogs are <laughs> hogs that snuffle through the manure left behind by other hogs in search of undigested grain. The tasty ones. <laughs> <laughs> double stuff. <laughs> yes, <laughs> double stuff. <laughs> and the fight, of course, proceeded from there. In another version of the story, though, which is no less stereotypical, Tolbert was having a grand old time buck dancing to a banjo hip, player hip. up on the official <laughs> buck dancing platform. Hip, hip. Yeah, yeah but you know what buck dancing is? It's when you shake your butt and stomp your feet? No, buck dancing. Oh, buck dancing. Yeah, you're saying <laughs> it's butt, butt dancing? Yeah. That, was that was invented in, in the 19- 90s. Yeah. Yeah, 1968. No, it's hillbilly tap dancing. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's the, almost like it's the music, yeah. kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Here, yeah, that, I, got, I got a good example of that's it. That's buck dancing. Kind of, that's buck dancing. <laughs> Yeah, this yeah. is like the leader of the Wild and Wonderful Whites. This was he was known for. I know what buck dancing That's is. That's buck dancing. I explained to you what buck dancing was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. was I'm glad from- you pulled up a video for our podcast. <laughs> I just looking at it. He's <laughs> saying nothing, man. He's just fucking kind of tough. I'd love to see you try buck dancing. It's difficult. It's extraordinarily <laughs> difficult. It's funny yeah, to look it's not at. just clipping and clopping. It's sliding as well. Yeah. It's just fun to see. Yeah, it is fun to see, but. You know, I'm just laughing. I don't think it's <laughs> yeah. bad. It's a, they'd use it for it's how what picnic tables are for in West Virginia. <laughs> I know. Well, there was an official buck dancing platform here, and Tolbert was up there showing off his skills when a Hatfield named Black Elias tried joining in. Aww. Tolbert, however, drunk as he was, started shouting that Black Elias owed him money for a fiddle, which Black Elias maintained was a debt that had already been paid. You owe me for the fucking fiddle. Fuck you. No, I don't. Fuck you. I gave you fiddle fucking money two weeks ago. <laughs> God damn it, Tolbert. I was like, Tolbert's a great name to yell. Oh, no, yeah. Tolbert's a good name. <laughs> Tolbert, you're getting on my last nerve. 
Fuck you, Tolbert. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, feels well, good, I just, y'all asked me for my opinion. You know, like, <laughs> I'm just Tolbert. If Shut we, the fuck up, Tolbert. I ju- you asked me for <laughs> I think that our audience at home should pause the podcast right now and just say, fuck you, Tolbert. Fuck you, Tolbert. <laughs> just feel real good for a little just bit. Just label somebody that you hate in your life a Tolbert. <laughs> <laughs> well, Black Elias then punched Tolbert in the chin and a fight ensued, which ended when Tolbert knocked Black Elias out cold. But after Black Elias went down, Ellison Hatfield stepped in. Tolbert allegedly called Ellison a cross between a gorilla and a polecat. Oh, hey, and, now. Hey, come on. Yeah. I mean, it, almost a compliment. No, almost, uh, that's yeah. what I would say. He's a I big mean, guy. He's I a crazy mean, guy. I mean, a, a cross between a gorilla and a skunk is a terrifying thing to behold. Yeah. <laughs> you can fucking spray. You can rip your face off and spray shit lumps into your fucking mouth. <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> and so the fight began. But pretty quickly, both men pulled out couple of knives. Sure. Now, while you might have like a switchblade or a hunting knife in mind when you picture their weapons, these guys were holding little folding jackknives. Whittlers. They're closer to shivs than machetes. Okay. Regardless, though, both started swiping at each yeah, other with on. their blades that the crowd watched. But Tolbert, smaller and quicker than Ellison, because Ellison's, you know, size Huge. of the gorilla. Yeah. Tolbert got the first stab, although the blade deflected off of Ellison's ribcage. He got it a little bit lower. It might have killed him. Since it was just a mere flesh wound, though, Ellison returned with a swipe to Tolbert's face, creating a gash that went from Tolbert's ear to the top of his forehead. But when the two of them crashed together to grapple, Ellison's jackknife closed on his own fingers, removing a weapon from the equation. That, however, didn't stop the much larger Ellison whatsoever, who knocked Tolbert to the ground with his heavily bleeding fists. But as Ellison put one hand to Tolbert's throat and punched Tolbert in the chest with the other, Tolbert stabbed Ellison's side over and over with the jackknife, shredding Ellison's hip and stomach. And to make matters worse, Tolbert's younger brother, Bill McCoy, cowardly stabbed Ellison while Tolbert was on the ground, then ran away. But even though Ellison had 27 stab wounds, he still had enough strength to grab a 10-pound rock that he was just about to use to smash Tolbert's skull. That, however, is when Farmer McCoy, who had thus far only been a bystander, pulled his revolver and shot Ellison in the back. That's for making fun of my name. (laughs) (laughs) And yet Ellison still did not die. Yeah! He wandered over to a tree and slumped down, while the constable, a Hatfield named Matt, the first guy with a normal fucking name in this story. <laughs> I'm just Matthew. <laughs> Matthew uh, Hatfield. I yeah. um He's I <laughs> developed a time machine uh, deep inside of my home in Southern California, <laughs> and, and now I'm here gazing upon the Hatfield McCoy <laughs> beginning of the feud. And my name's Matt. <laughs> <laughs> well, he arrested Farmer and Tolbert McCoy. As far as Bill McCoy went, he got away because he'd run off after stabbing Ellison. Unfortunately for Bill's brother Bud, though. The two of them looked almost exactly alike. So Bud McCoy was arrested for his brother's crime. Also a very old-timey thing that can happen. Yeah. yeah. They all probably look the same. Yeah, yeah. they're all Pretty weird. similar. Yeah. 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 Now, Preacher Ants Hatfield, the man who'd hosted the hog trial, he was now also the Justice of the Peace. So he had Tolbert, Bud, and Farmer McCoy sent to Pikeville, 25 miles away over the Kentucky state line, where the nearest jail was located. They didn't get far, however before two Hatfields caught up to them and convinced the constables that the McCoys needed to be tried in Tug Fork back in West Virginia because that's where the murders had taken place. This is so much chaos. It does make sense, though. Yeah. Sort of, but still, it's like a bunch of guys show up and tell two cops, hey, those guys are going to need to come with us. And the two cops are like, yep. <laughs> well, yeah, because yeah. it was a bunch of dudes who were going to kill those cops. Yes, to yeah. taste the guys. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, but in one direction is a judge... And in the other direction is Devil Ants Hatfield. Yeah. And so the McCoy brothers were brought back to Preacher Ants' house, which was the very place where the hog trial had taken place a couple years prior. Delicious. (laughs) (laughs) We need to have our own LPN hog trial. Yeah, I want a hog trial. (laughs) And we sentence this home to death. (laughs) Yay! I find this hog. Delicious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy about it too. <laughs> oh, I get to serve a purpose. <laughs> well, after much serious debate, Devil Ants moved the McCoy brothers to an abandoned schoolhouse and declared that if his brother Ellison lived, 
the brothers McCoy would be returned to Pikeville to stand trial. But he refused to say what would happen if his brother died, mm. which of course happened two agonizing days later. God damn. That's a big motherfucker. It's just yeah. also, it's just the uh, uh, dying in that time period is just bad. It's yeah. real bad. Yeah, it takes a long time. Now, in the time between the fight and Allison's death, the mother of the McCoy brothers and Randall McCoy's wife, Sarah McCoy, she'd traveled to the abandoned schoolhouse to beg for mercy concerning her sons. In response, Devil Ants promised that he'd bring her sons back to Kentucky alive no matter what. But Devil Ants made no promises as to what he'd do to the McCoy brothers once the state line was crossed. Nancy just tell him he's going to shoot her in the head. He's doing all these sort of like, yeah, I'll definitely make sure they make it to Kentucky. He and just wanted to get rid of her. Yeah, yeah. yeah just, yeah, I guess it not upset her. Yeah. Not have to shoot her in the head. Yeah. And so after Ellison McCoy died, Devil Ants and 20 of his henchmen, mostly his employees, marched Tolbert, Bud, and Farmer McCoy across the state line to a sinkhole where people tossed the carcasses of dead dogs. Wait, you say, where are we going? I thought we were going to... Where we going? Oh, Oh, I know where we're going. Oh, this is the saddest place in the goddamn world. <laughs> oh, this ain't good. Yeah, dead dog hole. Yeah, right, yeah, why yeah. are we going to dead dog hole? <laughs> I've never been to dog mud, Kentucky. <laughs> you think that our employees would ever allow us to march three other podcasters to a death, to a death area where they have to surround us in a cloud as we bring the smartless guys like to a place where we'll murder to dead them? Dog Hole. Yeah, yeah. Uh. Man, Bateman could talk his way out of any of them. I'd be like, you know what, Mr. Arnett, I am just pleased to be next to you. I ain't gonna listen to nothing you fucking say, Arnett. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's Squirrel Heart Mark. <laughs> you fucking tie a goddamn sock around that motherfucker's mouth because I don't want to hear nothing. Yeah, because about- he's charming. I don't want to hear about how he's just as upset about this as I am. Don't let his trifling performer's tongue fool you. <laughs> well, included in this vigilante group was a young man named Cotton Top Mounts, who was a bastard son of the recently deceased Ellison Hatfield. Cottontop had the intelligence of an eight-year-old and had a highly annoying laugh that irritated the other Hatfields. But he was useful because he was also incredibly violent. High body count. He'd probably mean... So once the vigilante group arrived at the sinkhole in the dead of night, the three McCoy brothers were blindfolded and tied to small pawpaw trees for the firing squad to come. Now you're going to wait. All right? You wait. You fight now. We're all going to sit here and we're going to wait. Just hours. (laughs) Cottontop, being the least respected of the Hatfields, was tasked with holding a lantern next to the condemned men so the others could see where to shoot. <laughs> God damn. Hold steady now. Uh, oh, no, we won't get you. We probably... <laughs> now, now, Daddy, we're going to have to shoot him in the head. <laughs> I feel like I'm kind of close. Now, get on in there. Get on. <laughs> when the word to fire was given, more than 50 shots rang out, which ripped Tolbert and Farmer McCoy to shreds. But no one had aimed at Bud McCoy, who was still trying to convince the vigilantes that it was actually his brother, Bill, who had stabbed Allison and run away. You don't want to shoot me, guys. <laughs> you don't shoot me, guys. Let's think about this for a second, guys. Uh, it was my brother. But it actually worked. <laughs> now, now, it was said that Devil Ants wanted to spare Bud's life because they really couldn't be sure if he was telling the truth. And he seemed to be pretty convincing. He's sitting there looking, he's like, hmm. As he's like trying to be like, he's my brother, see? He's my brother. And you're like, mm, was it now? Mm. But just as the Hatfield gang was walking away, bad Jim Vance walked up to Bud and pointed a shotgun in his face. Before pulling the trigger and blasting the top of Bud's skull six feet behind his body, bad Jim Vance declared, quote, Dead men tell no tales. <laughs> Cottontop then had his own fun, emptying his guns into the three dead bodies. Yeah! Yeah, you got him, Cottontop. <laughs> no, 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 good, good job, buddy. 
Good job. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, if we could have used those bullets, that's fine. You have his fun. We got to make them individually. These bullets are hard to come to. Actually, you do have to make each one. All right. Well, you can sleep inside tonight. Wow. When the bodies were found by the other McCoys, Squirrel Hunt and Sam, out of respect, I suppose, scooped up Bud McCoy's brains with his bare hands and slid them back into his open skull. We won't want to leave a mess. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> the worst part is squirrels get into these brains. <laughs> right, squirrels get into the brains. And then, I mean, because then he can get mad squirrel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, squirrels get strong. They get harder to kill. Yes. <laughs> he knows. He knows. <laughs> he don't want to leave a mess. <laughs> Now, Randall McCoy immediately formed a posse when he got word that his sons had been executed. But his highly religious wife, Sarah, begged him not to retaliate, saying that they should let the courts take care of the Hatfields. Reluctantly, Randall agreed, which was a huge mistake. See, a lot of relatives believe that if Randall had come back full force with a counterattack immediately, the feud would have ended there. Because in this part of the country, during this time period, an eye for an eye was the only principle anyone respected. But as one neighbor put it, if they think they got you on the run, they'll keep after you. And so the Hatfields did. And that's where we'll pick back up for the conclusion to our series on the Hatfields and McCoys. Now, we've been asked to do this series for a long time. And it's fun to do. I love this series so I this yeah. is so much fun. This is one of those and I I we got a lot of stuff coming up, but I'm excited where this goes cuz it just gets more violent. Mhm. Which I like. Oh no, there's midnight raids. Yeah, we've there's barely killed of... anybody yet. We're getting there. We got uh right like now five, right? it's uh 5 to 1. Yeah. No, so, 5 to 2. 5 to 2. So we've killed 7 people so far and we're going to go for between 12 and 24. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So we'll get there. <laughs> Super excited. Um, for those of you, we want to announce that we are officially on sale with Classy Night Out. It is going to be live in Los Angeles at the uh, Knitting Factory in North Hollywood, which I'm really excited for. I've never, We haven't done a show there yeah, yet. Yeah, I've never even been there, but it's on top of the Federal. So yes. if you know where the Federal is, it's, it's there. It's the top floor. Uh, December 22nd. We're gonna have a good old Christmas cavalcade, and we're gonna make you we're gonna make you laugh a little bit, and we might make you smile. I might make you cry a tear too. I don't know. Yeah, check it out. Just look for a classy night out at knittingfactory.com. It's in North Hollywood. It's gonna be a lot of fun. We've got a lot of LPM people doing the show. Uh yes. Sina Gaznavi, Jackie Zabrowski, everyone Amber that's Nelson. forced. Yeah, everyone that's forced to do the show will be there. That's right. Yeah, and we're gonna have some surprise guests. It's gonna be a lot of fun. I can't wait for this fucking show. I'm glad Classy Night Out is back. Oh, I love yeah, doing yeah. that show. Yeah, we'll be doing I love going oh, yeah, I, love class, I love going to Classy Night Out. Yeah, yeah, we're having a great time. Can't yeah. Wait. And the knitting factory fucking rocks. I'm glad there's one in LA now. That's Me too. <sighs> That's crazy. Also, I'm going to be uh, next weekend. I'm going to be in Boca Raton, Florida. I'm doing two shows on December 8th and 9th. Great. I'm fucking going home. I'm from Boca. I'm very excited for this. I've Hometown never, boy. Last time I performed in Boca, I was playing a cop in Guys and Dolls. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm so excited for the show. It's at the Soul Theater. I'm opening for a guy named Brian Kiley. He's like one of Conan's writers. He's unbelievable. Joke machine. Uh, so go check it out. I can't wait. I hope you all come out to the show. I would love to see you there. Um, that's going to be at the Soul Theater. It's all part presented by Comic Cure. Come check it out. That's great. Cannot wait. We also got uh, Operation Sunshine number two. It is for sale. Go and check it out at your local comic book store. We always ask you to go and ask for it by name yeah. at your comic book store. Um, it was sold out where I went. Yeah, it should be. It was, I, they, had to get, well. they had to get it shipped in from another comic book store so I can get it. So yes. it's, it's almost gone. So go get it now. Please, please. We worked hard on it. And I think it's really, I really love it. And the response has been really beautiful. When's number three Thank come you. out? Next month. Mm -hmm. Okay, nice. Well, soon. Wait. Every month. You yeah, know, a lot month. of these comic book stores, you can put your name in and they'll hold one for you. That's every, what Eddie just learned. Uh, you, you just learned it. It's called a pull list. Oh, a pull list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm or new to this whole or thing. Or a pull box. I pull mean, box. one of the two. Yeah, pull box. Pull it's list a, is pull. also an incredible bar in the Tug Bell. I love <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's right next. It's right next to pull box. Which yes. is a, I love going in difference. and pretending like I don't know you and shit. Just be like, hey, I hear these guys are funny. But they're offering something new. And honestly, I got to check. Check it out for myself. <laughs> like looking around. And don't forget to check out all the shows on twitch.tv slash LPN TV. Yes, next uh, week we got Tears of Cloud. We'll be back. No Dogs in Space is coming back on Monday. No Dogs in Space is every two weeks, Monday at 6 p.m. E 6 p.m. PST. Our next one is going to be on uh, Monday, December 4th. So tune in. Twitch.tv slash LPN TV for that one. Yeah. I love it. And come check out. We're going to do Good Put on Thursday next week. I'm really excited. Yeah. I got new material for 
for that. And Wednesday is going to be brighter side at 5 p.m. So we're all on that shit. We're up week. in that fucking or shit. Ooh, and um, I'm looking at my calendar. The Pasadena City College flea market's not on Sunday. Cool. Oh, there you go. Go have a nice time. I think I go will. Go have a bring yeah. your Subaru out back. I think you get 20% off. <laughs> um, there's uh, there's one other thing. Oh, we said it here. We said it on the stream, but I will say it here again. So open lines. We're not going to be doing open lines because we are shifting to focusing on a new show. So nice. just for people, there's confusion about the Sirius XM app. I've been people asking me. And honestly, I don't know the answer yet. So I will let you know as soon as we know where the new project is going to live. Yes. Isn't that fun? That's so like much that? fun. You guys like that actual, that's information that you can't use. Yeah, there you go. It it's doesn't help. Almost, yeah, it's almost like you gave no information at all. But I, that's all that I have. And isn't that what the show is all about? Hey, <laughs> why change now? <laughs> I got to get stoned. Can yeah. we get out of here? Hail Satan. <laughs> Hail game. Hail ham. Yes. <laughs> or ham, 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 This show is made possible by listeners like you. Thanks to our ad sponsors. You can support our shows by supporting them. For more shows like the one you just listened to, go to lastpodcastnetwork.com.